In previous videos, I benchmarked an AMD FX6300 against both an i7 and an i5. The i7 was obviously too much for it, but I assumed it would at least keep up with an i5. Nope. Everyone said I should use an 8-core FX instead against the i5, so, well... Here it is. I'll be testing this 8 core FX 8320 against the same quad core i5. This 8320 is similar to the i5 in terms of clock speed, however, it has far more cache and four more cores. It also uses a bit more power than the i5, but originally sold for about $50 less. Now, I mean, especially at the time that they were out, to be able to own an octa core processor for less money than a mid range Intel CPU? Pfft. Yeah, count me in. But was it worth it? Was it faster than Intel's mid-range CPU line? Or was it just good value for the money? Well, let's find out. The FX CPUs used a weird core setup where the cores were in pairs and shared resources such as cache and an FPU. The argument is still alive today as to whether these were real cores or not. One thing that you'll notice is that Windows sure doesn't think so. Windows 10 Task Manager lists this one as having four cores and eight threads. But that doesn't mean much as Microsoft is wrong about so many other things. But anyways, first up, we have Passmark. The Passmark CPU test shows the FX pulling a pretty strong lead over the i5 by over 800 points. One thing you'll notice, however, is that the CPU single-threaded score is lower on the FX, and you'll soon see why it needs those eight cores. Both of these boards use the exact same RAM. I swapped the RAM sticks between them. However, the FX fell behind the i5 here. Now this is interesting. The FX seem to be able to compress faster in 7-zip. However, as we saw before, 7-zip seems to compress each file independently, and that means the remaining cores have to sit around and wait until the others are finished before they can move on to the next file. This really hurt the FX. It seems faster at first, but the slow and steady nature of the i5 allowed the i5 to finish first. But not by much, only by about 14 seconds, so it's still pretty close. Cinebench was first run in single-threaded mode, and you can see here what I was saying about that scoring and pass mark. Single-thread performance is pretty low when compared to the i5. Now, we're doing these tests at stock speeds, so an overclock would definitely help the FX. However, at stock speeds, the i5 beat the FX by about 7 minutes. Cinebench in multi-threaded mode, however, was a completely different story. The FX came alive with its eight threads and owned the i5. The final score difference wasn't huge, and it finished only about 25 seconds sooner than the i5, but it's impressive to watch those eight cores go to work. Here, let's watch it again. In Handbrake, the FX again pulled ahead, finishing about two minutes sooner, with the FX rendering about 4.5 FPS higher on average. I ran XM Rig on each just to see what they could do. Now, neither of these would be profitable. However, with its eight cores, the FX was able to crank out almost 450 additional hashes per second. So far, the FX pulls ahead when it can use all of its threads. However, that's not going to help in all games. In Heaven, for instance, it fell a bit behind and was only able to achieve an average of 159 FPS. Still a great score, but the i5 won this one. Same deal with Superposition. The FX averaged about 84 FPS, which for a gamer on a tight budget would be great. However, the i5 with four less threads averaged 120 FPS. Need for Speed Most Wanted was released in 2005, long before either of these CPUs, and it wasn't built with lots of threads in mind. However, both did pretty well, averaging about 80 FPS. The i5 averaged a higher score, but only by about 6 FPS. Portal 2, as usual, played great on both, and actually the scores turned out to be nearly the same. The FX averaged a half an FPS higher. Unreal Tournament 3 ran fantastic on both as well, but the FX averaged about 18 FPS lower than the i5. Either way, though, both were in the triple digits, so at that point, what's 18 FPS? In a previous video, I ran GTA 4 on a Phenom X4, and I said how I was blown away with how incredibly smooth it ran. Well, I'm saying that same thing here. Now, the FX only averaged about 5 FPS higher, but the difference was night and day. Anyone who's played GTA 4 can tell you, you just expect delay and erratic input lag. I can say with the Phenom, and now with this FX, that wasn't there. It was buttery smooth, as if it was built just for this game.
GTA 5, however, well, it wasn't bad, but the i5 won this round. It averaged about 16 FPS higher, but on the FX, it just felt forced. It worked and it played okay, just something felt off. I didn't capture any of it here, but it was more about feel than anything. For example, if you spun around really quick, you'd notice a slight lag as it had to load the new textures, where the i5, that wasn't really there. It just, like I said, felt forced in comparison. But either way, we still got over 60 FPS running 720 on the FX. And here's the last part of the GTA 5 benchmark, if you want to just take a look and compare the two. And here's the BMNG Bustling Streets benchmark. As you can see, both are really close. And unlike before with this FX, it scored 2 FPS higher than the i5. And Y Cruncher. Looking back, I should have run a single threaded bench as well, but I didn't. But here's the multi threaded benchmark. The FX won this round as well and just barely pulled ahead of the i5 by about one second. So really, as you can see, it comes down to what you'll be doing. In these tests, if the software supported those extra threads, then the FX pulled ahead. To me, it seems almost like a handicap though. Because of its poor single core performance, it needs those extra four cores just to keep up with the i5. In gaming, well, it didn't do bad. I will give it that. Most of the time, it performed about the same as the i5, and in some situations, like GTA 4, it performed better. So was it worth it for the price? Well, yeah, I think so. Now, these prices obviously changed over time, and the ones listed here are the original MSRPs. But even if you go by that, this FX in particular would have been a great buy. It's cheaper than the i5 and with an overclock could probably even be faster. The problem comes in when we talk about power usage and cooling. Using this thing reminded me of the Pentium D. It's not as bad, but man, did it put out a lot of heat. You might be asking, why haven't I overclocked? Well, the heat sink I'm using just wouldn't allow it. I'm already pushing it to its limits just using the CPU. So if you want me to overclock and do a few tests again, you know, let me know, but I'll have to pick up a, a much better heat sink because wow, this thing can almost double as a space heater. Definitely not as bad as a dual core Netper Xeon, but, but it's close. Well, I hope you found this interesting, and uh, I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.